Thanks. Well, sounds good. Well, welcome everybody to the NCICC All Liver Cancer Seminar. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Hao Zhu. Uh, he's currently the Kern Wilkenthal Distinguished Professorship in Pediatric Research and uh, is Associate Professor now in Children's Hospital and UT Southwestern. Uh, Hal uh, obtained his uh, bachelor's degree from Duke and uh, MD from the combined Harvard and MIT program of the HST. Uh, actually, I also graduated from that program, but uh, probably more than 20 years ago. Uh, so my age is really showing comparing to Hal. But nevertheless, uh, it's great to have a, 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 a joint uh, a sort of a alumni relationship with Hal. And uh, he did his internal medicine uh, at San Francisco's and uh, medical oncology at Dana Farber and did his postdoctoral research at Boston Children's Hospital and then moved uh, to uh, UT Southwestern where he is right now. Uh, Hal's labs uh, focus on identifying the genes and mechanism that regulate regenerative capacity in the liver and understanding how these contribute to hepatocellular carcinoma development. Uh, Hal uh, is also an elected member of American uh, Society for Clinical Investigation, but perhaps I really got to know much better when uh, uh, we recruited him to be on the board of editors for gastroenterologies, and uh, we've been spending uh, quite a bit of time together every week, so uh, certainly I've gotten to know how better, and certainly I respect a lot of his insight and input as well as in the whole field of, uh, of uh, uh, liver cancer, although he wasn't trained as a hepatologist, but he certainly has uh, uh, learned a lot, I guess, during the process and certainly uh, done really great as a, as a, as a board member. And uh, uh, without further ado, I'll turn the, uh, turn the video over to uh, Hal. Well, thank you so much, Jake. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Anu and everybody at, uh, at the um, Liver Cancer Consortium over there. Uh, for this uh, really an honor to meet all the great people that I've met today and looking forward to continuing conversations there. Um, so, you know, I, I want to mainly talk about um, some of the work that we've been doing in, in tissue regeneration here in my conflicts. Um, but the core clinical problem and the core problem we want to understand is how does the regenerative capacity and the talent of this amazing organ relate to its, uh, you know, to its susceptibility to injury chronic injury from a variety of different etiologies that you guys all know about that leads to this clinical problem of cirrhosis, which is, of course, a major and common problem that leads to a wide variety of, of clinical manifestations and symptoms that we see commonly in clinic. Uh, and to top it all off, at the end of this process, you get hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the most common uh, primary form of liver cancer, commonly appearing in the setting of cirrhosis. So, um, you know, this is a very complicated process, and that's, I think, been a challenge for, for study. You know, it involves um, acute and chronic damage, which relates to cell death and damage, and then compensatory regeneration, which is the liver is very good at. And then given long enough of a time, this leads to inflammation, fibrosis, and then this cirrhosis. And so, you know, in particular, we want to understand what parts of these are adaptive and maladaptive in uh, contributing to cirrhosis and liver cancer. And so we're focused on how regeneration and injury uh, relates to this global process. So with that in mind, we, are, we like to probe the genetics uh, and in particular some, some of the somatic mutational events that occur along with other uh, genetic pathways that we would like to discover. And also this, the heterogeneity of uh, cell biology within the liver. And with these two variables uh, in hand, we want to probe these variables and ask how altering or perturbing some of these variables might contribute, um, you know, prevent, or promote hepatocellular carcinoma. And we also want to know how these variables might uh, increase or decrease liver function during chronic damage. So I'm going to tell you about a, a couple of stories um, uh, one of which is published and a couple which are not, um, uh, it, with, with these themes in mind. So as you guys already know, um, you know our, 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 our cells are not entirely wild type. We have, we have accumulated many mutations, probably starting very early on in our, in our life. 
um, in many different tissues. Now, there's you can't go by a, a week or two without seeing a Nature paper um, describing the mutational spectrum within a, a, a particular tissue or whatnot. And this is a famous image from or graphic from a science paper from Inigo Martin Carena showing that the eyelids of plastic surgery patients um, are chock full of mutations, recurrent mutations with significant clonal size. This is a one centimeter by one centimeter piece. And this story has been repeated in a variety of different tissues. Um, and we're now just beginning to grapple with the significance of these findings. So what do these mutations mean? Do, do they have any function? Does it mean that you're gonna get cancer? Does it mean that um, the, some of these mutations might be adaptive? So these are all questions that we're beginning to try to understand. And so a number of years ago, we also had the same question about uh, the cirrhotic uh, or chronically damaged liver. And um, you know, one of, the, one of the key reasons to look within the liver is that with, with, cirrhotic, um, with cirrhosis and chronic damage, we thought that somatic mutations might be more easily detectable because they're contributing to these clonal growths in the form of regenerative nodules or um, cirrhotic nodules. And we thought that if we can identify some recurrent mutations, they might illuminate some uh, known or unknown pathways in tissue regeneration. And then the key question of, are all of the mutations gonna be related to cancer in some way, or might they have nothing to do with cancer? So these were all open questions at the time. And this is published a, a couple of years ago, so I'm not gonna belabor th these points. But suffice it to say, we use exome and ultra deep sequencing to evaluate a handful, you know, uh, 150 or so genes in um, about uh, 40 to 60 patients. And we found that there were, the, the message was, we found that there were a number of recurrent mutations in uh, genes that were found in HCC, but there are also a bunch of mutations that weren't commonly found or commonly associated with cancer, namely PKD1, uh, PKHD1, PFARGC1 beta. So a variety of kinds of genes that appeared to have something to do with cancer and something uh, that may not have anything to do with cancer. So, a key, um, we're not really a genomics focused lab. So a key thing that we really wanted to do was to try to understand whether or not these genes or mutations might be enriched uh, uh, for functional impact in, in liver homeostasis or cancer biology. And to those ends, at the same time, a graduate student in the lab named Joyce Ja, an extremely uh, um, excellent graduate student, was generating a, a screen-based system in the mouse liver that was inspired by the work of Scott Lowe and Lars Zender from years ago, who'd use shRNA approaches to do the same thing. But what Joyce did was retrofit some of these Sleeping Beauty transposon cassettes with, um, with Cas9 instead of shRNA. So Cas9, guide strand, uh, or dead Cas9 in a CRISPR activation system. So essentially, um, these are transposons with an FH, which is a gene that rescues a, uh, a mouse monogenic disease called hereditary tyrosinemia. So this is essentially a rescue uh, or a selection marker. When you co-inject these into the tail vein, they will integrate into the genome. The FH will rescue the FH knockout mouse, and then clones will grow out. And you can measure the regenerative capacity of the genetic perturbation using a deep sequencing approach of the entire liver over three to four weeks. So if there's clonal repopulation that's advantageous, you'll see more sgRNA. If um, it's selected against, you'll see less sgRNA. So this is a system that we're currently use in the, in the course of our studies. But just to show you how it works, um, if you target P10, which has a good antibody for IHC, you can delete P10 in uh, protein in, the, in these clones. Uh, and it's associated with FH positivity. If you target with a non-targeting guide like GAL4, you really have no effect on P10, but you still um, uh, um, rescue with FH. So with P10, if you wait uh, three or four weeks, you can see that the guides um, or the cells which are lacking P10 expand, and so does FAH. And the livers appear to be steatotic, which is something that you see with classic P10 blocks the alleles or knockout alleles. So, this suggested that this approach will mimic the more classic and tried and true genetic. So with this tool in, in hand, 
um, we performed a pool screen on, on uh, about 150 genes that were commonly or, or appeared a few times in the cirrhosis sequencing, both in the exome and the ultra sequencing. And so this is in a, a way of asking whether or not these genes had an impact on regeneration. Now, I have to introduce an important caveat. We were not producing the mutations we found in the sequencing. We're, produce, we're performing a loss of function analysis on these genes. But nevertheless, it tells you if those genes have any importance in liver regeneration. So um, this is one of the first times that the screen was done and it actually worked quite well. You can see that the control guides fall along the line um, indicating there was no enrichment after regeneration, um, but there are a number of outliers, namely ARID1A, P10, PKD1. P10 I've already told you about, this is a, a comforting positive control. ARID1A was the gene that we had been studying uh, using classic mouse models and showed that when you delete ARID1A, it promotes regeneration. So it made sense that this also fell um, off of the line, was enriched when you delete ARID1A. A surprise was PKD1. Um, and so there were a number of enriched genes at the top of our list. And we decided to focus on a couple of PKD1 and KMT2D, um, which are not as well understood in the context of regeneration or cancer. So um, this is work uh, done by a staff research scientist in my lab named Min Zhu. Um, and what she decided to do was to take KMT2D um, uh, flox mice. This is a, a histone methyltransferase. So um, took these flox mice and only deleted one copy of KMT2D because we reasoned that if we found a mutation in serotic tissues that it probably was only going to be affecting one allele and not both alleles. So we wanted to ascertain whether or not a heterozygous deletion would exert any functionality. So what she did was get, either gave AVGFP or AVCRE to delete the flux allele, then give a variety of liver injury assays, carbon tetrachloride or thyroid hormone diet, and then analyze the liver. So what she noticed is that when you deleted one copy of KMT2D, you could prevent necrosis as caused by TCL4. And this is reflected in the liver function tests uh, and the necrotic area was also reduced. Moreover, if you gave thyroid hormone diet, which is a proliferation driving diet, the KMT2D heterozygous mice had increased hepatocyte proliferation as compared to controls. So on balance, these two assays suggest that if you only had one copy of KMT2D, it could prevent injury in certain contexts and promote proliferation, suggesting that the mutations found in the serotic patients could indeed be functional. So we then also looked at PKD1, which um, as you guys know, is a, uh, is a very well-known gene in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, which uh, it's mutated in 80 to 85% of those uh, patients. And so of course, patients are born with one mutant copy. A second copy is lost somatically to create this multifocal kidney cysts that leads to transplant and uh, kidney failure, or kidney failure then transplant. Of course, these patients can also get liver cysts, but a little bit less common, uh, commonly than kidney cysts. So um, PKD1 and PKD2, otherwise known as polycystin 1 and 2, um, are actually uh, not very well understood, to be honest. There has not been a consensus mechanism for how PKD1 mediates deleterious effects. And what we do know is that they're present in the cilia, uh, they physically interact with the cell membrane, um, and they have structural features of uh, G protein couple receptors. Um, we, we believe that the loss of PKD1 can activate oncogenic pathways like NIC, YAP, and TOR. How this happens is not entirely clear. Also, there's an activation of cancer metabolism. Um, there's been more recent evidence that PKD1 might be a mechanosensor uh, at the cell surface. So, that would be interesting in the context of cirrhosis, where, of course, the um, microenvironment um, and rigidity of the tissue has changed. Uh, but nevertheless, we decided to look into PKD1. But first, we wanted to um, really make sure that our sequencing was correct, because as you might expect, this low allele frequency and high depth sequencing can be very tricky. Um, so we took 32 more patients and uh, cirrhotic patients with uh, different genders, etiologies, and fibro fibrotic stages, but mainly um, stage three or four fibrosis. And we took chunks of their tissue and men chopped them up into um, 
uh, very small parts, pieces, so that we can get sequencing on adjacent pieces. And we also sent for adjacent histology. We ensured that there was no cancer in these samples. Uh, and then we did ultra deep sequencing again. So we were reassured that um, PKD1 was indeed mu mutated because it was the most, again, the most frequently mutated gene seen in approximately 37% of the patients that we sequenced. Uh, and the variant allele frequencies are low, so it's hovering around four to 5%. Uh, but many, some of the uh, variant allele frequencies got as high as 10 to, um, 10 to 15%. So uh, just to put this into context, if you have a 10% uh, heterozygous variant allele frequency, it would suggest that you know, 20% of the cells within that tissue um, have this particular mutation. So the variant allele frequency would be higher in terms of the number of cells that are affected. Um, and we also found a number of adjacent pieces with the same mutation, suggesting that the clones were big enough to cross, um, to cross at least the dissections that we had made. Um, a number of other genes were also common that we had seen before. And again, what we notice is that P53 and beta catenins were extremely rare, at least in this early stage of, uh, of sort of pre-malignancy. So we didn't really see that many cases of, of those genes mutated. Um, to sort of ensure that, that these PKD mutations were not sequencing artifacts, men had uh, done a handful of cases with higher allele frequencies to confirm by Sanger sequencing that PKD1 was mutated in a number of these cases, as well as PKHD1, which is a, a, another gene implicated in polycystic kidney disease. Uh, but we know from the literature that PKD1 sequencing is a, is an extra, is a challenge because this is a very big gene. Um, and also there are many PKD1 pseudogenes, which can trick exome sequencing into calling uh, mutations in the pseudogene to be thought to be in, in the real gene. So men had done, uh, men did long range PCR of PKD1 with very uh, intron specific mutations, I mean intron specific primers, and then did nested PCR around the sites where mutations were seen in our ultra deep sequencing. And she found that 14, uh, 14 out of 15 samples were validated with this approach. So she could detect um, uh, using this amplicon sequencing method, PKD1 mutations that were uh, seen from our ultra deep. So we think these mutations are real in the cirrhotic liver. And it kind of makes sense because the um, somatic loss of heterozygosity of PKD1 occurs commonly in polycystic liver disease and polycystic kidney disease. So the, the mechanism of mutation is already present in those syndromic uh, or, or those uh, monogenic diseases. So again, we use a similar assay as we did for CAMT2D, and we took uh, PKD1 floxed mice and either gave them GFP or AAV pre, and again found that with CCL4 injury, you could see reduced amounts of necrosis, uh, reduced uh, AST and ALT, and if you kept giving carbon tetrafluoride injury as you might expect, you had reduced amounts of fibrosis. Uh, as measured by Sirius Red. So this suggests that there's some uh, mechanism of tissue protection, at least for carbon tetrafluoride or CYP450 dependent um, injuries uh, in this context. So, um, you know, we knew that PKD1 mutations were not commonly seen in HCC, or at least not commonly called. We reanalyzed the PCGA data and found that there were very few cases of PKD1 mutation in the hundreds of HCCs uh, that we saw using the same mutation calling pipeline. So we think that they're not commonly found in, in HCC. So we went ahead and did, um, uh, you know, HCC models using this, these flox alleles or flox plus albumin CRE, and we gave BEN a day 35 and then harvested about one year we found that there was not really uh, much of a change in the HCC formation. It didn't really have much of an impact, maybe even a reduction of surface tumors numbers for PKD1 uh, haploinsufficient mice. So uh, knowing that PKD1 is actually somatically mutated in our human samples, we performed another experiment where we did AV-CRE at three to four weeks of age and then gave the 
And in this case, we saw a stronger reduction in tumorigenesis. So we believe that at least in the context of DEN, there may be a, um, a, a, some sort of tumor protection effect uh, when there is a PKD1 mutation. So interestingly, at the same time, um, um, some PKD1 uh, uh, polycystic kidney disease experts have contacted me about um, epidemiological data that they had found that patients with PKD1 mutations um, who undergo kidney transplant actually have a lower rate of um, extra kidney uh, tumorigenesis, namely uh, mostly in colon, than patients without PKD1 mutation. So it's interesting that there may also be a human relationship with tumor protection uh, with this particular type of mutation. So currently, um, unfortunately, I don't have the exact mechanisms. Uh, we're, we're using transcriptomic analysis of uh, PKD1 heterozygous livers um, to try to understand what the downstream uh, drivers of this, these phenotypes are. But uh, this is a, clearly a work in progress. And given the fact that this has been such a challenging gene to dissect, um, I think this is going to be a, a considerable um, effort on our part. So, uh, you know, this part of the talk is really to introduce this idea that um, mutations uh, in, in cirrhosis or the damaged liver really could have a life independent of cancer. And that, you know, we think of these Vogelgrams of mutation, then another mutation, then another mutation in a very linear fashion towards cancer. But it could be that um, there are all kinds of things going on with different types of mutations. Um, and so some of the implications here are that, you know, it's possible that we could discover other regeneration or fitness promoting mutations that may not have much to do with cancer or may even be adaptive against the tumorigenesis in the setting. Uh, what other mutations in other tissues could be influencing the, these kinds of functions independent of cancer? We're not sure, but I think there's emerging data in the esophagus and the colon that suggests there are, are mutations that are not necessarily driving cancer. Uh, again, p53 and beta catenin, um, these could be very highly specific mutations in terms of uh, cancer detection. And that could be very good in terms of using CFDNA or mutation calling approaches to diagnose early cancer. And I think what, what we're really gratified to see that our, our in vivo assay could really serve as a, um, a nice assay for gene discovery. And, and um, it's actually quite easy to use and we've been using it iteratively. And, and um, this next vignette I'll, I'll tell you about is um, uh, our efforts to look at epigenetic genes. Uh, so we, we had been interested in epigenetics in um, liver regeneration, liver biology. Uh, through the work on Eridin A. So we wanted to see if maybe there are other epigenetic factors, especially druggable ones, that might play a role in, um, in liver regeneration. So we borrowed Chris Vakuk's epigenetic library. Um, he's at Cold, uh, Cold Spring Harbor, and he made a very nice CRISPR library that targets the functional domains of these uh, um, epi factors, chromatin remodelers. And so, um, uh, so we use this library in our vivo, in vivo screening platform we did knockout and CRISPR activation screening. And what we notice is that what we look for are genes that are required or are depleted in the um, CRISPR knockout setting during FH mediated regeneration. Uh, and sorry, genes that, uh, sorry, sgRNAs that are um, uh, enriched in the knockout setting and sgRNAs that are depleted in the CRISPR activation or overexpression setting. So, there are a set of genes that have this overlap, BAS2A and BAS2B, um, that when you knock them out, they promoted clonal growth. And when you overexpress them, resisted liver regeneration or uh, became depleted. So we became interested because these names match, they're um, paralogs. And uh, so we looked into what these genes were particularly doing. So as I told you before, you know, there are many chromatin remodelers which package chromatin around uh, nucleosomes, uh, histone bundles that package a genome. And of course, these have become very important in cancer and um, all aspects of, of uh, biology. We had been focused on sweet sniff before, um, looking at ARID1A's role in liver cancer. Uh, so BAS2B and BAS2A, otherwise known as TIP5, 
are in the smaller nucleolar remodeling complex. This remodeling complex is also an ATP dependent uh, enzymatic remodeling complex, it uses the energy of ATP to move nucle nucleosomes around. But it's much more simpler than sweet stamp. This is actually called uh, um, complexes in the category of imitation sweet stamp complexes. And both of these operate with SMARCA A5. Um, so when we looked at expression of BAS2A and BAS2B, they declined during partial hepatectomy mediated uh, tissue regeneration, declined with a nadir around 40 hours for BAS2B, a little bit earlier for BAS2A. This is data from another paper published recently showing that um, BAS2A does not increase with age, but BAS2B does. So an, an increasing uh, decrease during regeneration, increase during age, suggesting an anti um, regeneration or anti-tissue healing functionality. Um, Joyce, uh, Joyce then validated our screening results by knocking out BAS2A or knocking out BAS2B individually rather than in this sort of pooled screening approach. The red represents FAH positive clones uh, as compared to control here. You can see that repopulation was accelerated, clones were bigger, had more BRDU labeled proliferation. So this suggested that both of these genes, um, uh, when deleted, promoted tissue regeneration or proliferation. We then went on to make BAS2B whole body knockout mice using CRISPR-based approaches. And, and um, interestingly, these mice look completely normal. Uh, they grew normally and they did not have cancer. We're showing an eight month old mouse here along with a wild type control. Uh, and these, these mice do not get cancer. Their livers look normal histologically and grossly. Um, uh, but remarkably, BAS2B deficient uh, mice have increased tissue regeneration upon partial hepatectomy. So this is at 40 hours after partial hepatectomy, BAS2B knockout mice have increased uh, regenerated tissue mass, even though you cut out the same amount of tissue at the beginning. Furthermore, um, there was increased proliferation as marked by BRDU uh, in these mice and increased cell cycle gene expression as you would expect. So upon injury, there's this inducible activation of regeneration in the context of BAS2B loss. Now at the same time um, that we were doing these studies, a Nature paper came out showing that BAS2, BAS2 uh, the worm ortholog, when knocked out promotes um, uh, increased longevity of worms. Um, and also in, in a part of the paper showed that BAS2B knockout mice uh, had improved cognition and memory in, in older ages. So this you know, made us really excited about this particular pathway. Lots of, lot to understand and lot to dig into. Um, it seemed like getting rid of BAS2 was providing certain benefits without clear negatives at this point. So we turned to looking at um, two bromodomain inhibitors that are specific for BAS2A and BAS2B, uh, GSK2801 and BAS2ICR. And these are bromodomain binding inhibitors that are specific for these two bromodomain containing epifactors. And when bound to these small molecule inhibitors, they dissociate BAS2 from the chromatin, um, thus negating the BAS2 functionality. So, we, so these inhibitors sort of didn't go anywhere. They weren't really developed for any clinical use. Uh, BAS2A had been shown to be potentially an oncogene, and so that may have been one reason to drug this particular uh, protein. Uh, but not much had been done with these inhibitors. So we applied the inhibitors to our tissue regeneration context, and we found that, again, uh, the inhibitor which hits both BAS2A and BAS2B can increase tissue regeneration after partial hepatectomy, maybe even more than BAS2B alone. Um, uh, in the context of carbon tetrachloride injury, BAS2 inhibition could block carbon tetrachloride induced necrosis and increase proliferation as marked by uh, key 67 here. Uh, and uh, for a more clinically relevant setting, giving BAS2 inhibitors right at the time of Tylenol or shortly afterwards, uh, after a toxic dose of Tylenol could increase uh, survival um, uh, rather significantly uh, compared to vehicle control. So these are all um, interesting uses for this potential inhibitor. Um, 
we then asked, you know, could the regenerative effects extend beyond just the liver? And uh, we used the DSS colitis model and we gave um, mice either the, the BAS2 inhibitor or a control inhibitor and found that the BAS2 inhibitor had preserved, more preserved body weight, even though this is a small difference, preserved colon length as uh, measured here. This is a this is an assay that sort of looks at uh, preservation of colon integrity in this DSS model and increased uh, crypt proliferation in the context of BAS2 inhibition. So this it's, um, potentially points to another indication for BAS inhibitors, uh, maybe in refractory colitis. Um, so what is the mechanism of, what are the mechanisms associated with these uh, BAS2 inhibitors or BAS2 functionality? So, what Joyce did was a partial hepatectomy, then either gave, um, gave BAS2 inhibitor or control inhibitor in this context, did RNA-seq, uh, and then evaluated shared perturbed genes uh, between 12 and 40 hours. And long story short, essentially we found not surprisingly that cell cycle uh, genes were increased upon BAS2 inhibition. Um, cytochrome P450s were decreased, indicating a reduced differentiation. Uh, reduced terminal differentiation in these livers, at least during uh, the regenerative phases after partial hepatectomy. But most notably, um, BAS2 inhibition was associated with increased ribosomal protein RNA expression. So RNAs that encode for ribosomal proteins seem to be increased in the setting of BAS2 inhibition. And um, connected with this, although we're not sure about the exact order of events, mTOR targets uh, Essex kinase and 4-BP were increased in the context of BAS2 inhibition, partial hepatectomy. All right, so, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this as if nothing was known, but of course something was known about BAS2, um, uh, the nucleolar remodeling complex. And what was known previously is that BAS2A or TIP5 worked in this complex to maintain heterochromatin around the highly repetitive ribosomal DNA loci. So, it maintained uh, the shutdown of ribosomal RNA production. So when you lose BAS2A, you actually uh, de-repress ribosomal RNA production um, uh, with uh, uh, the, this long ribosomal RNA transcript. So it made sense that ribosomal proteins could also be increased uh, upon BAS2 inhibition. All right, so ChIP-seq had never been done with BAS2. So uh, so what we did was take H2.35, these are immortalized mouse um, hepatocytes, overexpress BAS2A or BAS2B with a flag tag and did chip sequencing on these, um, on these cell lines and then gave in the inhibitor and, and in a satisfying sense, giving the inhibitor against these BAS proteins almost completely ablated the, the BAS binding sites. So the endogenous or the overexpression binding sites for these two species of BAS2 were most prominently associated with ribosomes and growth pathways uh, that you might expect, uh, namely mTOR signaling, thyroid hormone signaling. And so um, there are differences between BAS2 DNA, but ribosomal biology is a commonality. We then took the, um, our ChIP-seq analysis and overlaid a number of markers that we had looked at, BAS2A, BAS2B, um, a tax seek measuring the openness and closeness of chromatin, uh, and also H3K27 acetylation, which is a, a marker of transcriptional activation. So Joyce came up with a list of 55 um, gene loci that, were, um, that showed changes for all of these markers. And among these 55 um, loci, there were a good number of ribosomal proteins indicating direct targeting of ribosomal proteins in addition to ribosomal RNAs. So here I'm showing you a single track for RPS14. Um, both BAS2A and BAS2B bind this. Uh, upon the drug BAS2 inhibitor, um, H3K27 acetylation increases, in, uh, indicating uh, tra more transcriptional activation in the absence of BAS um, uh, binding, and also increased uh, chromatin openness around this loci. So it really does indicate that there's some direct targeting of ribosomal proteins. But that, you know, 
just because it targets ribosomal proteins or ribosomal RNAs does not mean that it necessarily promotes protein synthesis. So uh, Joyce evaluated this. She gave the inhibitor to mice undergoing partial hepatectomy mediated regeneration and used a chemical probe called OP Puro, which is a quick chemistry tag for uh, a fluorescent marker for um, uh, nascent protein synthesis uh, transcripts. So, so OP Puro can measure new proteins being made in the tissue. And what she found is in the presence of BAS2 inhibitor, there is an increase in OP Puro uptake within the liver, suggesting increased protein synthesis rates. And that's quantified here. In addition, um, the 45S ribosomal RNA was also increased at the transcriptional level uh, in, in both baseline and uh, after partial hepatectomy. So collectively, this does suggest that increased protein synthesis is a result of BAS2 inhibition. But then I would say, well, we don't know if protein synthesis is the reason for the increased regeneration. And so for that, we needed a functional um, mouse model to test whether or not protein synthesis was involved. And so we turned to a very well-used, well-known ribosomal protein called RPL24. And this is a mouse in the heterozygous state, um, which has a white belly spot and a kinked tail. And this is a mouse that develops normally, can regenerate the liver normally, but has trouble increasing protein synthesis rates because it has a defect in the RPL24 ribosome. So in this context, um, when given the BAS2 inhibitor, we had a harder time increasing liver, liver to body weight ratios after BAS2 inhibition as compared to the control mice. This is a small difference, this is a partial rescue. But when we look at proliferation rates, it's more clear. So BAS2 inhibition in the wild type mice are able to increase proliferation. But in the context of the um, belly spot RPL24 heterozygous mice, had a harder time increasing proliferation uh, in this context. So this is suggesting that protein synthesis could be an important downstream target of uh, BAS2 inhibition. And this is showing you gene expression for cell cycle related genes um, in the context of wild type and um, uh, RPL24 heterozygous mice, showing that you can get a rescue or a partial rescue of cell cycle related genes in the context of RPL24 deficiency. All right, so to summarize this part of the talk, essentially what we identified through an in vivo screen is that the importance of BAS2A and B proteins, which are bromodomain containing proteins that regulate ribosomal proteins and ribosomal RNAs to, to um, regulate ribosomal biogenesis. So when you inhibit these proteins, you get increased ribosomal biogenesis, increased protein synthesis, that only operates in the setting of uh, injury-induced regeneration. And so this leads to increased regeneration. But it's important to know that at baseline, this is not activating protein synthesis without a triggering um, uh, signal. So this isn't causing growth uh, in the absence of injury. So what we're doing now is to, we think this is an interesting pathway. We're using the, the small molecules as chemical probes to study uh, the relationship between regeneration and cancer. And we want to know what the underlying basis of a lot of these interesting phenotypes are. How does the protein synthesis relate to the aging phenotypes and uh, cancer phenotypes? And furthermore, we're, we're attempting to develop small molecules for, for clinical applications. All right, so um, in the last part of my talk, I, I'm going to talk to you about some published work that we've done and include some unpublished work. And here um, we tried to address a, a slightly controversial question in the field, which is whether or not there's a defined source of new hepatocytes during steady state homeostasis and, and liver injury. So I think, uh, I don't think I need to tell you, you guys this, but this is an important question, I think, because um, First of all, it would be nice to come to some agreement on whether or not some hepatocytes repopulate or proliferate more than others under different conditions. And this could impact um, how we make hepatocytes, what we try to transplant, um, the genes that are regulating proliferation in hepatocytes. And I think this could also impact our understanding of chronic disease evolution and cancer evolution. So, you, you know, you guys have looked at 
um, tissue sections of, of the liver looks very monotonous. Um, suggests that there's a lot of similarities between different hepatocytes, but um, in reality, of course, hepatocytes are zonated, uh, classically divided into zone one, two, and three. Blood flows um, from the portal triad, from the from the gut, down the sinusoids, out the central vein, and it traverses this metabolic zonated series of hepatocytes that that fulfill different metabolic functions. And um, a very elegant work from Benzo's group, as well as uh, Shalev Itzkovitz's group, have really defined the heterogeneity of different hepatocytes. These are showing zone one gene markers and zone three gene markers. And this is single cell sequencing now done by several groups, showing that lots of genes are zonated. And in fact, most genes are zonated um, in the liver, at least in the mouse liver. And that there's this very elegant uh, distribution of, of labor. All right, so this is another view of zonation. Um, in the periportal side, you have a certain metabolic functions. In the pericentral side, you have other metabolic functions. Um, uh, and these are marked by gene expression in some metabolism studies. Uh, but the question for us is whether or not there's functional differences in terms of regeneration, cancer biology, um, you know, fatty liver pathogenesis as it relates to the different zones. And, and people have begun to sort of try to answer this question with different markers that occur across the zones. And I'll introduce some of those uh, here. So um, Roel Neuss's group at Stanford, um, uh, led by Bruce Wang, had shown that th there's a population, a rare population of axon two expressing hepatocytes around the central vein in zone three that may proliferate over time to cover uh, the liver during normal hemostatic um, growth. And so this is a one-year tray showing these rare axon two um, cells uh, occupying the liver over time. Uh, so this is thought to be potentially a progenitor of stem cell. Uh, and Michael Cairn's group around the same time had shown that there's a SOX9 population around the peri, uh, in the, around the portal triad or the, uh, um, the portal side of things, which expands or streams towards the central vein in the context of pericentral injuries, as would make sense. But under normal homeostatic conditions, they show that there's no proliferative activity of these particular cells. And more recently, Steve Artandi's group at Stanford showed that there are these rare TERT positive uh, hepatocytes that are kind of distributed throughout the lobule that repopulate during injury and normal homeostatic conditions. So obviously um, a good amount of uh, um, different candidates for stem cells or progenitors and uh, quite a bit of controversy around this. So um, Yong Long Wei, a postdoc in my lab, took on a heroic effort to try to um, systematically address this question. And he, um, this is the key contribution, which is that he made um, 11 new Cre-ER lines. Uh, and the way he did it was he put Cre-ER into the three prime UTR of different zonated genes using CRISPR technologies. And this is um, injected by Yu Zhang and her CRISPR core um, using a variety of different methods that I won't get into. Um, but I'll describe these lines to you. So this is a snapshot of individual mice um, with different zonated reporter expression patterns. These top two, the, the top one here is all hepatocytes, no bile ducts. Um, this one is all hepatocytes except for the innermost ring of, of uh, zone three cells. And progressively down, this is a zone one labeler, a zone two, three labeler, a zone three labeler, the GS zone three labeler, and the zone two enriched marker here. So different um, zonal populations marked by these reporters. And so essentially we did the kind of obvious uh, simple experiment, which is to uh, lineage trace all of these populations over the course of a year uh, after tamoxifen um, labeling at around six to eight weeks old. So the first thing we found is that um, when you label bile ducts or when you label hepatocytes but not bile ducts, it shows that there's no exchange or no transdifferentiation of uh, hepatocytes into bile ducts or vice versa during sort of uncomplicated normal homeostasis. And this is known by the field, and we just wanted to show this um, uh, that our tools were, uh, were faithful to what was already known. So we then looked at a glutamine. Uh, 
uh, glutaminase free, which labels all the zone one cells around the uh, portal vein, you can see that it spares the central vein. And when you trace this over a year, these actually shrink and get smaller and smaller. So the cells don't get smaller, the zonal compartment becomes smaller um, and the, uh, the other compartments become bigger. And this is quantified by tomato area uh, as shown here. Now to make sure this was right, we took the opposite population, which is marking all of the central vein um, uh, adjacent cells in zone three and zone two-ish. Um, and we traced this over time and found that there was an increase in this population that almost exactly matched uh, the data from the zone one tracer line, um, that there was an expansion, a very slow expansion. This is not a rapid expansion, but a very slow expansion over time, over the course of a year. All right, so this is consistent with the idea that potentially the axon two positive cell around the central vein could be mediating this expansion. Um, as shown by uh, Roll News. And so we took our glutamine synthetase line, um, which marks only the, you know, where the axon two population should be around the central vein. And we found that there was no expansion of, of B cells at all. So it was absolutely stable over a year or longer. We again did the opposite kind of labeling. We took this ARG arginase 1.1 line, which labels everything but the glutamine synthetase domain around the central vein. And we again found pretty similar results, although we did see a little bit of encroachment of these cells over long periods of time, as you can see here, but not a lot of change in this population. Okay, then we had another line, which is really nice, which spared a bigger swath of cells around the central vein. So I, I think of this as a zone three negative labeler. So it labels everything but zone three, and here is a cool result where the zone three population appears to get smaller and smaller until it reaches the glutamine synthetase population and it sort of stops there over time. Okay, so I've told you zone one and zone three both get smaller, suggesting that something in, in the middle gets bigger. Um, but I forgot I added this slide, which is a long, longer term label, 20 month label um, to sort of uh, ask whether or not zone one and zone three ever goes away. And I don't think they do. So when you look at the zone one population after one year and eight months, which is approaching the lifespan of a mouse, you don't completely get rid of these cells over time. So they're persistence. And likewise, when you label with CYP1A2, you don't completely get rid of this zone one population. And again, ARG1 does seem to encroach upon the central vein over this long period of time. And I'm showing you sort of close-ups here. It could be that if you kept on tracing, you might take over these populations, but it's probably that zone one and zone three have their own devoted populations that are replenishing. Okay, so we then did an EDU tracing experiment where we uh, labeled EDU for about 10 days. And what Long story short, we basically found that in the mid lobule, there was a higher proportion of EDU positive cells as compared to zone three and zone one, suggesting that there's something emanating from the mid lobule that is sort of replenishing cells. And um, to sort of gain a little more support for this idea, we have a uh, hepcidin labeler, which is enriched in zone two, although I have to admit it's not perfectly enriched in zone two. Um, but these cells appear to expand over time as quantified here as well. All right, so what I've told you kind of so far is that under normal homeostatic conditions, if you divide up the lobule into three parts, it appears that zone two kind of occupies a little bit more over time, maybe encroaching on uh, central vein and, and portal vein uh, regions if you wait a long period of time. What I'm not gonna show you is that you, you're gonna get exactly what you expect from pericentral and periportal injury. I think of this as kind of like a planaria. If you cut the head off, cells from the body and cells from the tail will regenerate the head. If you cut the tail off, cells from the body and cells from the tail uh, will regenerate the rest of the animal. So th that's kind of what you get. And I think it kind of makes sense because zone two is in the middle, sort of protected from 
uh, zone one and zone three injuries, which are the most common. Um, but nevertheless, this is the data that, that we have generated. And I have to say that um, at the same time that our paper uh, had come out, a, a, um, a, another paper from Benzo's group had shown exactly the same thing, which is that in zone two, there were a greater proportion of proliferating and regenerating cells um, uh, in zone two. They use an orthogonal uh, lineage tracing method, uh, probably a more elegant one than ours, um, that showed that zone two was a source of proliferation. And um, I have to note that Holger Willenbring had also shown that there is an increase in proliferation in zone two as compared to zone one and zone three. So it appears that a number of studies are corroborating some of these results. So um, I think I have a few minutes here. So what's the mechanism of this? So uh, um, we and others have done single cell sequencing and this has nominated a number of genes in zone one, zone three and zone two, which might be important for metabolism or function out of proliferation. Uh, we also borrowed data from Shalev Itzkovitz's group. This is published in Nature Metabolism about a year ago. And they did bulk sequencing to get a very deep gene expression profile of different zones. And we took about 100 genes that are up and down in zone two. Uh, and we took these genes and we put them through our CRISPR screening platform that I already discussed before to see if we can identify the genes that were most likely to be regulating proliferation, because this is a proliferation assay. Uh, so long story short, we found obvious genes that uh, were both important in the knockout and um, maybe a little bit sufficient to drive proliferation in the CRISPR activation setting. And lo and behold, cyclin D1 is one of the genes. So we, we took a complicated route to find a simple answer. And we then looked at cyclin D1 and others had observed this too, including Paul Manga and uh, Holger Willenbring that cyclin D1 expression is remarkably mid-lobular. Um, this is an absolutely, to me, it's a beautiful expression pattern um, where cyclin D1 appears to be more focused in the mid-lobular regions as compared to zone one or zone three. So already this suggests that the mid-lobule is proliferating more uh, even before doing any lineage tracing. So um, what we did is a series of experiments trying to chemically inhibit cyclin D1 or just frankly delete cyclin D1. And what we found, of course, as you'd expect, is when you chemically inhibit or delete cyclin D1, you really ablate proliferation, um, uh, particularly in the mid lobule, because that's where proliferation is focused. Uh, all right, so what's upstream of cyclin D1? And it's known that mTOR is upstream of cyclin D1. So mTOR inhibitors were used and we found the exact same results. When you use an mTOR inhibitor, you reduce mid-lobular proliferation. And then what's upstream of mTOR? And this is, um, this is sort of new data, unpublished data here, uh, but we had been looking at this gene called IGFBP2, which is a secreted factor known to be mid-lobular in its expression. We generated a cre or knock in recently. We've only analyzed a few of these mice, but what you can see is a really cool zone two expression pattern of, of this particular reporter mouse. And this is gonna be a super useful tool for the study of zone two. And, um, and so this gene becomes an obvious candidate. IGF-BB2 is secreted, interacts with IGFs in the extracellular space, also interacts with integrins, does a lot of different things. And um, the net effects are pro-growth uh, and this is indeed a, a bona fide oncogene or cancer promoting secreted factor. So we overexpress IGFBB2. We found, as you would expect, increased, slightly increased pore activation, AKT uh, phosphorylation, and 4EPP phosphorylation. Uh, we then borrowed mice from uh, Cliff Rosen's lab at the University of Maine. The whole body deletion of IGFBP2 gets rid of IGFBP2 and it gets rid of cyclin D1 or, or at least reduces cyclin D1 quite significantly. And also mid-lobular proliferation is, is reduced. So, um, that's, so that's it. So we think that hepatocytes are different in different zones. Um, they replenish differently. Uh, um, we think that mid-lobular populations are 
preferentially repopulating, but I don't think it's the only repopulating population. Uh, we think that zone two might be protected from some of the damages that are common in, in liver uh, injury. And uh, we're still working on this, but we think that IGFPP2, PI3 kinase, mTOR, cyclin D1 is an important pathway for zone two growth. Um, and, and, and this is not, not surprising. So these two genes, HAMP, hepcidin, and IGFPP2 are regulated during chronic liver disease and fatty liver disease. So we'll be interested to, to understand how these genes affect different zonal populations in, in this context. Uh, finally, I wanna thank the people who did the work. Um, I mentioned Joyce, a fantastic graduate student who's done all the screening and set up the platforms. Yonlong, who's done the linear tracing, Min, who's done the PKD1 work and the cirrhosis sequencing, uh, and then of course the mouse core for doing the injections and our uh, funding agencies. So um, I'd be happy to take questions. I'll stop sharing for the moment. Um, and uh, looking forward to um, answering any questions you guys might have. Okay, Hal, this is uh, I'm finally able to get back on. I think somebody was controlling our camera and uh, <laughs> video that I can't sign okay. back on. But anyway, uh, see, I still can't get my video back on. But anyway, uh, that's fine. Um, I know the hour is late. Is, uh, do you want to maybe look at some the chat or whether there's any question you can answer uh, sure. at this point? Yeah, just go sure. ahead. And, okay. Uh, Yes. What is the contribution from Vish, uh, Vishaka? Yep. What is the contribution uh, of aging in the endothelial cell portal vein uh, towards the differential proliferation of different zones? Ooh. I don't know. I don't know. Um, what is the contribution of aging in the endothelial cell? Frankly, I don't know. Uh, you, I guess the question is pointing to the question of is there cell-cell interactions that are, um, that are maybe producing signals or, or affecting uh, the gradient of zona zonated proliferation? Um, yeah, that's right, yeah, that's the question. Yeah, and I don't know. I know that in the zone three, in the endothelial cells from the central vein, it's thought that WINTs are secreted from those endothelial cells that would, um, that would affect uh, growth in zone three and probably represent a gradient. Um, but what are the signals that are causing zone two to be a focus of proliferation is really unclear to me. I think what is, what is going to be emerging is that zone one and zone three are, have more fully terminally differentiated hepatocytes and zone two may have a mixture of some less differentiated hepatocytes with lower differentiated uh, gene expression and increased proliferation related gene expression, at least during um, uh, in the younger months, which are growing their livers and turning over the livers. Okay, uh, hopefully <clears throat> that, yes. Yeah. I have a question, may I ask? Go for it. Uh, is it possible that the cells in the different zones actually have different half-lives. We often think of the lifespan of a hepatocyte as roughly one year, <laughs> uh, but is it possible that they're actually functioning almost as three discrete organs, yet obviously they're not, but could they have different half-lives? Yeah, I think we'll let it go. Yeah. Um... Three different half lives. So you mean like their 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 lifespans are different, and um, yeah, they're like let's say let's say your some hepatocytes die sooner, uh, but get replenished faster, and their turnover is faster. Um, I agree, that's very possible, probably likely to be true. But what we're finding, what we're measuring, is the net gain or loss of cells from a particular zone. So we're measuring the addition of birth, death, everything. And when you see an expansion of that reporter's population, 
you know that the net gain is higher than the net loss. Um, but you're very right. It could be, it could be super fast um, death proliferation cycles. And that's why we think that measuring proliferation is not the only way to measure turnover. You have to account for loss of cells. Um, and, but I do agree with your point that maybe zone one, zone three, and zone two have independent self-renewing populations. Uh, it's just that zone two has a bigger swath. It's, it's occupying most of the area of the liver you know, the zone one and zone three, they're getting smaller and smaller. So that the self-renewal probably is not catching up entirely with cell loss. I don't know, there's a lot to, lot to look into. And I think also domesticated mice, as I was talking to uh, Barbara about, domesticated mice compared to wild mice probably have very different levels of turnover depending on what they're eating, what they're drinking, how many bars they go to and, and whatnot. Um, so yeah, those are all open questions, but it's nice to be able to see the turnover, to measure it. All right, Li Ching, um, liver has immune zonation as well as uh, Kupfer cell zonation. Do you think they contribute to zone specific hepatocyte regeneration? Probably, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, I don't know. I think endothelial cells are zonated. Um, I wonder if the non-parenchymal immune cells are zonated. I think there's evidence, right, that the, there's some zonation which is um, affecting liver biology. Um, likely to be yes. So essentially what we're doing now is taking the tracing mice and putting them through different assays to ask, um, what's happening under different conditions, high fat diet, alcohol, various things. And so maybe we'll get insights into that. Okay, Hal, right, I Anand. think maybe there one other question, maybe just the last question you can answer. Um, and then uh, I know you do okay. have meeting with others and actually I have tons of questions I'll ask you when I meet with you. So go right. ahead, and once you answer the last question, we can uh, right. bring the session to a closure. All right, are, are they specific to the liver or is expression somewhat conserved among tissues in the body? Oh, uh, and are they rich genes revealed in screens evolved in pathways besides protein synthesis? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the BAS2 genes are all over the body and could have effects in different tissues. Certainly, probably do. Um, the genes that we found in the screen or various screens they do have a variety of effects not limited to protein synthesis, um, but I don't really have time to get into those other hits. BAS, I think, is dominantly operating through protein synthesis regulation. Um, all right. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you very, very much. For, oh. Yep, thank you very much, Hal, for that uh, very uh, insightful and entertaining lectures, and I guess, uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I assume, Anu, you have any uh, announcement about the next seminar, or the, we would just let everybody know through email. Well, if not, okay. Well, thank you, everybody. How I'll see you in the breakout room, okay? You can take All a right, break if you want. Bye-bye. <laughs>